everyone's doing well. It's, it's Tuesday, it's Neurology Morning Report. Nice to see everyone. And we would be very grateful if anyone has a case they'd like to present or was hoping to present today. And we would love to have two discussants, ideally one identifying as a woman and one identifying as a man. Do we have anyone who is hoping to present a case today? Anyone who is hoping to discuss today? We have lots of people who are excited to greet everyone in the chat. That's nice, thank you. And was anyone hoping to present a case today? Was anyone hoping to discuss a case today? Okay, I think we have a case if nobody wants to present one. I've heard our friend Gabby, who's always has thousands of cases, has a case, is that true, Gabby? Yeah, okay, great. So can we have two people to discuss Gabby's case with me? Maybe you're thinking it was not gonna be neurology this morning, it was gonna be some other type of morning report. So you could have discussed hyponatremia or elevated liver enzymes or abdominal pain. Sorry, it's, it's neurology, but it'll still be fun. And neurology is part of medicine, even though sometimes it doesn't feel that way. No, no takers. Maybe you're thinking English isn't my first language. I'm not sure if I'll feel comfortable. We have Spanish speakers and French speakers and a growing cohort of German speakers and Portuguese speakers. And so, um, all right, we have a volunteer. Fantastic. Yasmin, great. Would anyone like to join Yasmin in the discussion? I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name right. You'll tell us in a moment. Um, well, yeah, why don't? Fine. What's that? It's Jasmine. It's fine. Yasmin, sorry. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Well, maybe Gabby and Yasmin, would you like to introduce yourselves? Tell us where you're from, what stage of um, training you're in, and then hopefully someone will be inspired to discuss with um, the three of us. Maybe I can start. I am Jasmine. I am a Mexican IMG right now. Uh, living on San Antonio. I've already graduated and I'm starting this journey of my step preparation. And yeah, I have been uh, coming here to VMR sessions for uh, uh, one month. This is my first time discussing. Yeah. Fantastic. And tell me just once more how I can pronounce your name correctly. Jasmine. Jasmine. It is a J, J sound at the beginning. Thank you. Great. Welcome. We're so glad you've uh, joined us to discuss on, uh, for the first time. And anyone like to join Jasmine to discuss? Gabby, maybe you can introduce yourself and hopefully by then someone will be inspired to join the three of us. Oh, did someone volunteer? Great. Um, Leah, fantastic. Okay. Um, great. Leah and Gabby, do you want to introduce yourselves? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Ria. I am a medical student from Austria, and this will also be my first time discussing. So, um, yeah, a bit nervous, but really excited to learn. Great. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Um, and um, Gabby, do you want to introduce yourself? I think most people um, know you, but just in case. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Gabriela. I am from Brazil, and I am a neurologist here. Um, I'm excited for today's case. Great. Well, we're so excited to have you presenting this case and um, Leah and Jasmine, very excited to have you um, discussing it with me. So Gabby, would you like to give us um, just the chief concern, chief complaint, and we'll begin discussing it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's uh, facial pain. Facial pain. Okay, um, Jasmine, what comes to mind when you hear facial pain? What sort of things are you starting to think about? Uh, the first thing I would ask is uh, exactly where, if she can look pain, um, if, uh, well, the patient, I don't know if, like, which get gender uh, this person is, but the first thing I would ask if it's located, if it's created, uh, how does it feel? Is it feel like a numbing sensation? If it's, if it's a tingling? or if it worsens or it gets better with anything. I, the first thing I will think about facial pain, especially thinking about neurology, I will think uh, trigeminal pain. That's the first thing. 
Yeah, all great thoughts. So as with any pain, um, as you said, we'll want to have a better understanding of where it is and what it feels like and do things make it um, better or worse. And then you mentioned a potential diagnosis. One of my mentors, um, Marty Samuels, who does reports like this, you can find them advertised by Tracy Milligan um, on Twitter. And he's the person who I got to learn from in Morning Report for several years during residency. Um, he always talked about this book um, by the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, um, Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. And he said, we do this in diagnosis, right? You hear something and immediately you have a fast diagnosis, a pattern recognition that may turn out to be true, but you have to pause and, and then think slowly and make sure you don't get stuck on that diagnosis. So one of your thinking fast was the same as mine as you heard facial pain, neurology, morning report, trigeminal neuralgia. So tell us a little bit what you know about trigeminal neuralgia, Jasmine, and what aspects of the history as they came through might make you um, consider that diagnosis more or less. For me, I will say it, it, uh, it has a, especially the facial, uh, the cranial nerve five, it is normally a, a pain that worsens with uh, chewing and it is intense. So the patients I've seen with it on my primary care, it, they come with this, um, it worsens when any time especially when um, chewing and it feels like, I don't know how to say it in English, especially like it's a pulsating feeling. Yeah, you can tell us in Spanish and we will. It feels like a burning pain. Mm -hmm. Pulsatile, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Pulsante, how did you say it in Spanish so we learn? It's pulsante, it pulsante. feels like a needle. Needle, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, shock like. Shock like, yeah, very good. Excellent description. Yeah, so trigeminal neuralgia. We if this becomes part of our more of our discussion as we learn more than these two words, we'll get into more trigeminal neuralgia versus neuropathy, um, etc. Um, but um, right, it's a condition that affects the trigeminal nerve, most commonly the V2 and V3 branches. So V1 is sort of the area of the eye and forehead, uh, V2 is well, mostly the eye, the V2 is the sort of um, mandibular. Um, so I'm sorry, the maxillary. So the part sort of over the cheek and then V3 is the mandibular, which is the jaw. It's usually V2 and V3. And it's very shock-like electrical sort of neuropathic pain. And as you mentioned, Jasmine, when we learn about this as medical students, across all the neurologic diseases that, that sounds so disabling, we think, oh, just facial pain, that, that shouldn't be so disabling compared to multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease or a stroke. But as you said, this is extremely disabling. It's it really, the patients really feel like they're getting struck by lightning um, in their face. And the slightest little irritation, as you said, chewing, wind blowing on it, brushing their teeth can set off paroxysms. I have a, a strong memory of a patient we saw when I was a resident who was hospitalized because the pain was so, severe and didn't even want us to come too close to the bed because she thought if we bumped the bed, it would set off this kind of paroxysm of very excruciating um, pain. So um, this is a diagnosis that would mostly be made by the history. So you gave us some important features to um, think about if we hear them on the history that might lead us toward or away from this diagnosis. And it looks if it looks like this is what's going on, we'll have a lot more to say about what causes this, um, et cetera. Um, very good, excellent, um, Jasmine. Um, Leah, any thoughts? to add here or what, what are you thinking as we are about to hear the history? Yeah, for me also, the first thing I thought of was the general pain. And then also maybe if you think of nerval involvement like zoster or something, that could also be pain. Um, or any other kind of maybe impingement of a nerve also, maybe if it has to do with the jaw kind of uh, joint. Um, so you could ask triggers or other associated symptoms also. And um, yeah, also I thought it would be interesting to see the time course because the trigeminal pain was like, can be really sudden and onset and also like not that long, but if it's a constant pain, then it could be something different. Um, so yeah, those are kind of my first thoughts. Yeah, great thoughts. We know it's neurology morning report and that Gabby is a neurologist. So presumably the diagnosis will not be a dental or you know, um, jaw-related um, uh, diagnosis. But of course, thinking more broadly, if one was in a primary care clinic, trigeminal neuralgia might not be the first thing one would think of, right? There could be all sorts of dental, sinus, and other 
um, causes a facial pain. But within the nervous system, the sensation to the face is from the trigeminal nerve. So by first pass, we'd be thinking of some condition affecting the trigeminal nerve, uh, its branches, um, or um, its entry zone into the pons. So the trigeminal nerve, as we were saying, has three branches, ophthalmic, um, maxillary, and mandibular. And those three branches carry um, facial sensation, including the cornea, uh, including the mouth, including the tongue, although not taste, right? Just facial, um, just um, somatosensory information. And that information is brought back, those three branches um, come together. Uh, eventually, they also they pass through different uh, skull foramina, um, which can be remembered. I forget which book this is from, I think Blumenfeld by the mnemonic standing room only, which is the foramen spinosum, foramen rotundum, and foramen ovale. And V1 and V2 go through the cavernous sinus, V3 does not. Although neurosurgeons have told me that V2 doesn't actually go through the cavernous sinus, it just says that in textbooks. I'm not sure what the truth is there. And then there's a Gasserian um, ganglion, and then they all sort of um, end up, and there's, sorry, the motor branch to the face, which I, uh, to the um, muscles of mastication, which I didn't mention for reasons I'll say in a moment. And then once it's sort of a whole nerve, that nerve enters in the dorsal pons where most of the sensory information um, arrives in the brainstem. And just like for the body where pain and temperature go one way and vibration and proprioception go another way, the trigeminal sensory information splits up as well. And it actually has nuclei at all three levels of the brain stem. So there's a mesencephalic nucleus of five in the midbrain, no real clinical relevance there. It's for jaw proprioception. And then there's the motor nucleus for muscles of mastication. That's one of the bronchial motor nuclei that's sort of medial, but not midline in the pons. There's the main, also called principal, also called chief sensory nucleus of five, which is in the dorsolateral pons for light touch uh, sensation. And then for some reason, the pain and temperature fibers travel down through the pons, through the medulla, even up to the cervical, uh, down to the cervical spinal cord and then cross and come back in what's called the spinal um, nucleus and tract of five. And so that's important to know because we had, when you have lateral medullary syndrome, if you're remembering the basic brainstem mnemonic of one, two, three, four, midbrain, five, six, seven, eight, pons, nine, 10, 11, 12, medulla, you might think, well, five shouldn't be involved in the medulla, but yes, the pain and temperature are part of that lateral medullary syndrome. And that's why patients can have pain and temperature loss um, in one side uh, of the face uh, in lateral medullary syndrome. And so if there is facial pain due to a problem with the trigeminal nerve, that could really be from anywhere along uh, this pathway from uh, the brainstem out um, to the periphery. So you could have problems in, as with any cranial nerve in the meninges, um, in the skull base, or somewhere um, very distal um, uh, in, the, in the face itself. And so um, I saw who's doing the teaching point. Sammy is um, ahead of us because he's actually putting some teaching points that haven't yet um, been said, which is always impressive. And one of those is that he wrote associated with MS. Now, Sammy, if you don't mind me calling on you, if the trigeminal nerve is a peripheral nerve, how is it getting affected in MS? You're right, and I know that you probably know the answer to this, but if you don't, that's okay. I thought that multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. So it can only affect cranial nerve two because the, uh, the retina and cranial nerve two are part of the central nervous system, but I shouldn't get other cranial neuropathies from MS. How come we can see trigeminal neuralgia in MS? Do you know, Sammy? No, I don't. I just know the fact. <laughs> you just know that. This is very memorable to me because when I was a medical intern, um, I was very excited that halfway through the year, I got to start having my neurology clinic in the afternoons. Oh, do you know Yasmin? Jasmine, yeah. sorry. Is it, is it, I think I remember this uh, because actually one of my professors asked me and it was because uh, if I'm not wrong, it usually results because of a blood vessel pressing on the, uh, I mean, uh, if you have MS, uh, it's usually because it, it also affects the myelin sheath. Like without it, it I know it sounds like very redundant, but it, it, it actually, it's, I was reading it something like, um, no, never mind. I, I got it. But. You're, um, you're very close. So MS is a demyelinating disease, right? But for some reason, it chooses to demyelinate the central nervous system, which is myelinated by oligodendrocytes and not the peripheral nervous system, which is myelinated by Schwann cells. Um, so, um, but, but it does have to do with the, 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 the myelin because we're talking about MS. So 
The answer is that this actually affects the trigeminal nerve entry zone. So the white matter in the brain stem, you would say the nerve looks like it's exiting, but in the case of five, it's entering. You have Schwann's well, Schwann cell, Schwann cell, and then once you're inside the brain stem, you have peripheral myelin, uh, central myelin. I saw a fly by in the chat, the nucleus. Well, the nucleus is gray matter, right? So we shouldn't be demyelinating. It's not white matter, right? And this is, we call MS a white matter disease, though seven Tesla MRI studies are showing that it does probably affect gray matter as well. In any case, I was saying at one of the, so I finally got to have my first neurology clinic and one of my first patients was a young woman who described classic trigeminal neuralgia. And I thought, oh, it's trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and I told my preceptor, I thought, oh, wow, I, I can, I, I saw a case of something I know about. And he said, well, we should look for MS. And I said, MS. And he said, yeah, if you see a young person, particularly a young woman with trigeminal neuralgia, that's very high on the differential because it's usually the idio, so-called idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, which is from a vascular loop pressing on the fifth nerve is usually a condition in older people or people who've just had dental work. And if you see sort of out of the blue trigeminal neuralgia in a younger person that you should consider MS and really look closely at the brainstem on MRI and see if there's a demyelinating plaque um, right where the trigeminal nerve is, has entered uh, the pons. So I think I've only seen one patient with MS um, develop this. I've never seen a patient with MS present with trigeminal neuralgia, but it's a great point that Sammy made. And it's a confusing one, right? Because you wouldn't expect cranial neuropathies beyond cranial nerve two in uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Other things we could think about here, well, there's a whole um, field of headache neurology, right? And many of you have heard me mention the international classification of headache disorders, which is like the DSM-5 of headaches because most diseases like conditions like migraine, tension, cluster, they don't have um, uh, biomarkers, right? That we're aware of in the blood or on imaging. And so we just need a really good description. So I call this like the taxon taxonomy of flowering plants of headache diseases, right? And you have thousands of these where someone has, group has gotten together and said, to be a cluster headache, it has to have these features. And so there are conditions like um, paroxysmal hemicrania, hemicrania continua, um, uh, cluster headache, um, sunct, which is sudden onset unilateral nasal congestion and tearing, suna. Anyway, these all fall under what are called the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, which are conditions of facial pain, either brief bursts of it or longer periods um, that are, quote, idiopathic. They're caused by something, but we don't know exactly um, what they are caused by. But they're so rare that usually we would get imaging anyway to make sure there's not some lesion uh, provoking these. And they're worth knowing the difference between them because paroxysmal hemicrania and paroxysmal, uh, sorry, and hemicrania continue actually respond to indomethacin, um, which is part of the diagnosis. You give patients indomethacin, why this should work, we have no idea, and they get much better very quickly. And I think Gabby has actually presented a case of one of those to us that was an indomethacin responsive trigeminal autonomic cephalgia that was either paroxysmal hemicrania or hemicrania continua. So morning report bias with Gabby really present us another case of this same rare disorder, um, maybe, but maybe not. So that's one of the other things to think about, although I think we all quickly jump to trigeminal neuralgia as a common cause of facial pain. There are these other facial pain um, syndromes. And of course, if this wasn't neurology morning report, we'd have to think about sinus and dental and um, things like that. Okay, well, those were rich um, two words for us to discuss. Thank you, Gabby, and excellent um, Leah and um, Jasmine. So um, tell us uh, what you learned in the history, Gabby. Mm -hmm, of course. So it's a 30-year-old female that presents with pain in the right side of her face in the maxillary zone, characterized by burning and stabbing episodes lasting 5 to 10 seconds repetitively. The pain started a few months ago when she had around 10 episodes per day, and now she's having around 100 episodes of paroxysmal pain per day. Uh, the pain is triggered by eating, by contact with anything like hot, hot or cold water, and even uh, speak. She has associated rhinorrhea in the right side of the face, and the pain is very severe. Uh, she went to several dentists uh, because she thought the problem was with the teeth, but everything was normal. Uh, Previous medical history, she has uh, hypertension, obesity, 
uh, she was treated for B12 deficiency some months before, uh, and she denies any uh, herpes zoster infection in the face. Medications, she uses hydrochlorothiazide, and that's it. Uh, and no social history or allergies or anything else. Great. Um, Leah, we'll have you discuss the history, and then um, Jasmine will come back to you for the physical exam. So what are you thinking based on this history? So I think because we just discussed also the age where we'd expect like the um, idiopathic trigeminal pain, this is more unlikely because it's a 30 year old woman now and uh, makes me more think of secondary causes. So um, she doesn't have much in her, um, in her past medical history except this treatment of B12 deficiency. Now, maybe I would ask whether the treatment was successful or not, um, and how, yeah, how the status of that is at the moment. But other than that, I'm also, um, as we mentioned, MS in a 30-year-old woman, this would be like the typical age where this could present. So definitely on the differential list. And um, yeah, maybe also, did she have headaches? Do we know that, Gabby? No, she only had facial pain. Uh, thanks for asking. And also regarding your other question, uh, she was successfully treated for a B12 deficiency. The B12 came back uh, to normal and they didn't find any cause of the B12 deficiency. Okay. So of course this, maybe we could go further and then discuss what could cause B12 deficiency without any known risk factors such as you know dietary intake or malabsorption. Um, or maybe some kind of um, gastritis or something like that. But um, to come back to a differentialist, I'm not sure, but what could affect the, the nerve besides like um, MS, for example, but maybe she does have um, some other kind of infiltrative disease that could affect the nerve or um, yeah, we have also, we don't really have any history for infections. So um, she doesn't give us uh, much information on that. What is interesting though, is she's a young woman with hypertension. So I would expect hypertension maybe in a more older patient, but then um, again, we don't know what other risk factors there might be. Um, yeah, but these are, this is all I have at the moment. Yeah, those are great thoughts. I should say, as soon as I said, Idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia tends to occur more commonly in older patients. I doubted myself. Someone can tell me if that's true. Gabby, you're shaking your head. Is that um, your reading and experience also? Yeah, I think so. But I'm, I'm going to double check. And yeah, we'll double time. check. This is a common uh, experience. Uh, of this is what I feel. <laughs> yeah, of saying something and then saying, is that, did I make that up? Or is that true? Or if it's true, where did I find it? And then um, it gives you the emotional valence to go find it and be sure. So maybe someone can help with that. That's, I, I think that is um, correct, but I'm happy to be um, wrong and learn from it. So right, Leah, um, looking just at the characteristics of the syndrome, this does sound very neuropathic, as you said, right? Burning, stabbing, um, pain. This does not sound like the type of pain from, um, you know, a toothache with sort of dull, aching, um, pain or sinus sort of dull pressure. This has that neuropathic sound. So something's going on in the trigeminal um, nerve and it's very paroxysmal and seems to be triggered by sort of mechanical aspects. So all of those are um, fit with uh, trigeminal neuralgia. The only thing that might not is this rhinorrhea. That's sort of an autonomic um, feature which might make us think of one of these sunk suna. And I think the difference between them, I've never seen either of these, but I've read about them is that Sun, there's tearing of the eye and there's a lot more autonomic stuff. And I think sooner you only need one out of whatever the criteria are, but someone can um, double check me on that. And um, well, just to pause there and talk about that for a moment. So there's sunk, there's suna, there's um, cluster, there's paroxysmal hemicrania and there's hemicrania continua. All of these are trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. So they cause facial pain in a sort of neuropathic um, uh, with a neuropathic quality. And then they have autonomic features like eye tearing or eyelid uh, periorbital edema. You can see pupillary findings, nasal congestion, um, all of these things. And the difference really is in the 
length and frequency of episodes. So sankt and sunnah, they're very short, I think seconds, and they can be hundreds of times a day. Um, uh, paroxysmal hemicrania, I think they're also um, relatively short, but maybe in the tens of times per day. And then um, cluster is sort of the word, the name cluster, I believe, is because they tend to cluster around a particular time of year when they sort of last for, for hours or days. And then hemicrania continua, the continua is that it's pretty um, constant. So these sort of are clinical diagnoses. Um, but if we were going to say this fit with one of them, it would be sort of the, the, the short and very frequent episodes would be more on the sunct suna side. And so if there's only one autonomic feature, I think that would mean you'd call it suna, but someone would have to double check. And yes, Maria, I'd have to look it up in my own um, book to, to see if, um, uh, if I have the numbers right there. And like I said, you might say if these are just sort of things that somebody made up and wrote down, <laughs> why does it matter? Well, because the treatments are a little bit um, different. So I agree with you. I think trigeminal um, pathology is uh, possible here and whether it's due to something actually affecting the trigeminal nerve or one of these um, idiopathic or unknown cause, uh, trigeminal autonomic cephalgis remains to be seen. And of course, we're not hearing about other things elsewhere in the, in the, in the body to suggest a large lesion um, somewhere. So this seems to be very specific to the innervation of the face. And as you mentioned, based on our discussion before, this is a young person, a young woman with um, trigeminal neuralgia, we'd certainly um, want to uh, consider the possibility of multiple sclerosis for the reasons we said. Um, let me ask you both before we get into the exam, um, Jasmine and, and Leah, um, in so-called idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, the, the classic form where the cause may be a vascular loop kind of impinging on the nerve, as Jasmine um, said, but there's no, um, beyond that, no structural pathology um, affecting the nerve, no demyelinating plaque, um, no, um, nothing else beyond the blood vessel pressing on that. What would you expect to see on exam in, in sort of idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia not caused by structural lesion? The facial spasms, uh, the patient, uh, it, it has a progressive course. What I would uh, want to ask you is if this um, pain characteristics, this episodes do, are, um, how much do they, do they last because if I correct me if I'm wrong, I I I remember if the criteria to dive like how much does it last because it uh, it says that it shouldn't last more than two minutes every episode. Uh, the pain it can be um, triggered by any innocuous stimuli, and uh, it's um, also the patient may have this. Uh, psychological distress. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great points that you might have heard this term for trigeminal neuralgia, tic douloureux, um, the painful tic. And it's not a tic, it's because patients sort of wince um, in pain when it, when it happens. Um, um, right, I think the length of trigeminal neuralgia, the spells are sort of, um, are classically very brief, sort of just quick on, quick off seconds. Um, however, I think um, patients, you know, as you, as people have described this condition, I believe there are um, sort of, there's a new, relatively new classification that I'm not up to date on, but that describes sort of other variants of this. But the classic is these very brief um, paroxysms of pain, sort of just like being shocked by electricity and then stops, but they can kind of stack up um, and, you know, happen repeatedly. Let me ask this. Let's say we decided to try test trigeminal function on the neurologic exam. What would, well, let me back up. How would we test trigeminal function on the neurologic um, exam is the first question. And the follow-up question will be, in idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia caused just by a vascular loop, would you expect any abnormalities on the exam of the trigeminal nerve? Any thoughts, Leah or Jasmine? So I think if it's idiopathic, I would not expect any other defects except for the, maybe like the exam could trigger the, the pain if we touch the, like, touch, um, the face of the patient. But other than that, I would not expect any abnormality. Yeah, that's right. That's my understanding as well, that when this is caused by a vascular loop, again, there is a cause, but it's still considered idiopathic because um, there's no you know, plaque or tumor or whatever um, causing this. Then the sensory exam, if you did pinprick um, over the face, should still be normal. 
And if you hear the story of trigeminal neuralgia and you actually find objective abnormalities in the sensory exam of, uh, in the trigeminal distribution, that's actually very concerning that there is a, a cause that you're gonna be able to find on imaging. And then there's uh, maybe not entirely relevant to trigeminal neuralgia since it usually affects V2 and V3 as in this patient, but there's the sensory exam, as you all know, is, is uh, difficult. You're doing the pin on one side, the pin on the other, and the patient will say, do it again. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Does it, is it different on the two sides? Do it again. And we don't do it the same every time. So it's, it can be hard to interpret that. Um, although um, if you're using a pin and you're being careful and the, um, you know, usually you should get something, but it can be hard to interpret. Um, but there is one objective test we can do of the trigeminal um, nerves. Anyone know what, what that is? A little more objective. Yeah, Jasmine? The 50 ancillary test? Oh, yes. no, uh, just another test on the physical exam. Oh, uh, just to see if there is any weakness on the facial muscles. And as uh, Shema, I, correct me if I, saw, if I say it wrong, uh, her, yeah, uh, Shema. your corneal reflex. Yes, exactly. Very good. So let's talk about the muscles of mastication. We all memorize this as medical students. Trigeminal nerve does facial sensation and muscles of mastication. Um, but to get a lesional cause of weak chewing is extremely rare. Now, jaw weakness in myopathies and myasthenia gravis, very common. Um, the so-called, you know, uh, what's it called? Um, is it called fish mouth hatchet face? These are not um, particularly kind ways of describing the face in myotonic dystrophy is in part because there's um, jaw weakness. But for, to get a lesion of the trigeminal nerve or the trigeminal pathways causing unilateral jaw weakness, just don't see it, right? Gabby, you can tell me if you've ever seen it. How many strokes have you seen with tongue deviation and facial weakness and eye weakness? Have you ever seen the jaw to one side? No, why is that? Chewing is really important, right? And those pathways are bilateral. So both sides of the brain are sending input to both um, trigeminal motor nuclei. So I remember saying that in a neuro neuroanatomy lecture and then one um, resident said, I've seen one case of a dorsal pontine lesion causing unilateral jaw weakness and sent me the case in the picture. I said, okay, so you've seen one, but um, super uncommon. Like I said, bilateral in myasthenia, myopathy, sure. But um, lesional trigeminal, causing um, weakness of chewing. It's just too important for survival, right? So the brain has all kinds of ways of um, protecting that, um, that bulbar, that, that, that chewing function. Um, so the corneal reflex, right? A little less relevant of something affecting V2 and V3, but if a patient is really telling you they're sort of numb up here or their eye feels you know, funny, we should be able to test that objectively with um, afferent through V1 and um, efferent through the seventh nerve of the uh, innervating the orbicularis oculi and checking the corneal um, reflex. And then there is a jaw jerk um, reflex, but it's, it's pretty variable in, in patients, a little hard to interpret, and that's trigeminal in and trigeminal out. The proprioception of the jaw goes actually to the midbrain and then out um, through um, motor. And really the only time I've seen that useful, others can say if they've seen it useful in other places, if the patient is very hyperreflexic in the limbs, you're trying to get a sense of whether this is cervical spine or something higher, you can check the jaw jerk. And if that's brisk too, you know you have something going on um, higher than the spinal cord. But if it's absent or if it's sort of weak, it's to me a little bit hard to interpret. Do you have other thoughts on that, Gabby? Or have your professors showed you other ways of using the jaw jerk? No, it's, um, it's, it's so variable that it's a little hard to interpret. So yeah, of course, as with any patient, we want to do a full neurologic exam head to foot. And if I was examining this patient, I would probably not spend too much time actually on the face. At the beginning, I'd do my usual exam just to get the broad brushstrokes and go through the whole exam to see, oh, wait a second, there's arm weakness, numbness too, or there's hyperreflexia, or there's some, you know, there's all kinds of stuff here. And I don't want to get distracted by saying, oh, I found it. It's a V2 lesion. You know, I'm, I'm done. Let me just quickly do the rest of the exam. So I usually do a, you know, head to toe whole neurologic exam somewhat quickly to just get a broad sense of what the patient looks like. And I say, okay, now let me spend my time checking the corneal, checking, you know, pin and V1, V2 and V3. Maybe I would check a jaw jerk probably. Um, I admit that I probably would not, would not um, but um, it's a good idea. And um, maybe you would learn something. And so, so that's probably how I would proceed. And the big question would be, is there any objective finding here, because if there is actually decreased facial sensation or a decreased corneal reflex, um, we, we have to be very suspicious that 
we need to image along that whole path of the trigeminal nerve and look for something compressing it or a plaque at the trigeminal nerve entry zone or something going on at the trigeminal nerve entry zone. I just said plaque, thinking of the young age of this patient and risk for multiple sclerosis. And if we found nothing on exam, we'd probably still image this patient. And if there's a vascular loop there, we could say that, well, that could be causing the trigeminal neuralgia, but we'd still try to treat it medically before thinking about the, um, the surgeries there, because those are big skull-based surgeries to get in and separate the, the vessel from the um, trigeminal nerve. Um, and if we found nothing there on the imaging, um, we'd try to treat this as trigeminal neuralgia. And if that didn't work, and we can talk about treatment once we have a better sense of what's going on, we might try treating for sunct or suna and see, um, see what happens. So Gabby, what did you find on the exam? Was there anything, nothing or surprises, no surprises? <laughs> no surprises, the neuro exam was normal, uh, including phonoscopy as well. Uh, I just wanted to add, I put on the chat, I don't know if you saw it, about the, the epidemiology. So it's more common for tri trigeminal neuralgia, it's more common in people older than 50 years old. So our thoughts were correct. Okay. <laughs> another yeah. thing that I wanted, to, yeah, another thing that I wanted to add is that actually for people who have trigeminal neuralgia in the V1 uh, distribution, uh, rhinorrhea and autonomic symptoms can be common. Um, so yeah, for even for trigeminal neuralgia, but they are more common in Suna and Sunch. Interesting. Yeah, I had one attending who was a headache specialist um, when I was training who said his hypothesis, I don't know if anyone else has written about this, was that Sankt and Suna and Cluster were actually trigeminal neuralgia of the V1 branch and that that's why it caused pain and all of these autonomic symptoms, whereas V2 and V3, there's not sort of autonomic function there. So I thought that was a very clever and interesting way of thinking about um, that. Okay, so we have a normal exam. Um, Jasmine, what should we do with this? And if this was your patient, what would you do next? Well, uh, the guidelines say that you can do an MRI, CT, head, maxillofacial with IV contrasts. But uh, as I say, I'm thinking idiopathic. Anyways, if we have it imaging, um, maybe a, I don't know how, how, Often do they do this on hospitals? Ele electrophysiological, electrophysiologic trigeminal reflex measurement, or just to see what is going on with it. Like to to just to how do you say to just think that it's idiopathic, like confirm it's idiopathic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I would definitely image this um, patient because. Um, it could be idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, but we don't know that until we've made sure that there is not something they are pressing on the nerve beyond the vascular loop or something at the trigeminal entry zone. And um, sunct and suna and paroxysmal hemicrania, et cetera, et cetera, those are rare enough that it is recommended to image and make sure that the syndrome, which can be idiopathic, is not being caused by a lesion. And I believe I've read, but I've never seen this play out in real life, that you have to pay special attention to the cella, that there can be lesions in the pituitary region that for whatever reason can cause these syndromes. And again, pearls from um, Marty Samuels, um, actually he, he does these morning reports and sends these um, emails and I'm lucky to still be on these emails and even though I don't work at Brigham and Women's anymore. And actually this morning's was talking about someone with headaches and a slightly elevated prolactin. And he was talking about how everyone presumed there would be a pituitary adenoma and they were all fooled and it was a posterior fossa mass. And he made the point that most adenomas in the pituitary are pretty small if they're only secreting a little prolactin and that shouldn't cause a headache actually. And he joked that um, it's not the adenoma causing the headache, it's the headache causing the adenoma, by which he means so many people have headaches, so many people have incidental adenomas that you go looking for the cause of the headache and find an incidental adenoma that wasn't contributing. And he said it would have to be big enough to press on the dura and once it's pressed on the dura, then you have pain sensitive structures that are innervated by the trigeminal and that's why you get this referred facial pain. So sounds like they were discussing a similar um, case this morning, but for whatever reason, I was just wondering if that's the relationship of these facial pain um, syndromes are sometimes associated with pituitary um, lesions and maybe it's because it's pressing on 
um, trigeminal innervated dura, or it's pressing on maybe V1, V2 in the cavernous sinus. Um, but in those cases, if we're really pressing on the nerves themselves, we should expect to see some um, sensory loss on exam, though the sensory exam is hard to do and hard um, for us to interpret and hard for the patient to interpret sometimes too. So I agree, let's um, hear if the MRI is normal, shows a vascular loop or shows something um, completely different and then we'll decide um, what we wanna do. And if it's um, normal in this patient, the treatment might give the diagnosis, right? Um, so let's first hear just <laughs> the imaging um, Gabby, and then we'll talk about what we might do next. Yeah, so the brain MRI showed a vascular compression at the right trigeminal nerve root. Okay, so Leah, Jasmine, what is the diagnosis here? So I think um, this is just what we talked about. So it could explain the um, trigeminal pain due to the vascular compression. And if there is no other cause like on imaging and the neuro exam is normal, then I think um, we could try treating for um, idiopathic trigeminal pain, although I'm not sure what the treatment for this would be exactly, but I have no other clue of this being a different diagnosis. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so this is, I'm gonna, I think there's a good, do I have it here? It's a really good issue of continuum where there's, I think, a whole article on trigeminal neuralgia versus neuropathy and this classification of idiopathic versus not. I don't, I'm looking at my continuum shelf. I think it was one on outpatient general neurology, which I don't see here. But anyway, if someone has access to continuum and can find um, this article, um, it's helpful in, in those terms. But yes, I think this is what would be called idiopathic, even though there is a cause and it's vascular compression and why vascular compression um, does this because the vessels normally run through the nerves? Is it kind of just the pulsation causes um, some type of odd frequency to be set up in the nerve? Is it um, over time, this pulsatile compression um, sort of erodes some of the myelin there and the exposed nerve is then um, uh, firing abnormally? I think that is unclear. So how would you, um, Leah, suggest we treat this patient for trigeminal neuralgia? Jasmine, how would you treat the patient? First, uh, since the patient comes here, like with all, right now she's having a lot of pain, I have read that you can give, consider uh, like infusion, uh, again, uh, with cardiac monitoring or uh, go directly to the uh, local anesthetic uh, for chronic therapy, the carbamazepine and I don't know if like, since it's a vascular compression, think about uh, therapy, microvascular decompression, but always uh, weight and uh, benefits, risk and benefits for this patient. Yeah, so part of the, I believe someone can check me, I believe the diagnostic criteria are actually uh, in part responsiveness to carbamazepine, which is an anti-seizure medicine, um, sodium channel inhibitor, why it should, affect this condition is unclear, um, but it can. And in general, um, even on very low doses, if this is the right diagnosis, the patient will get much better um, quite quickly. Not always perfectly, but even just very low, sort of minimal 200 milligrams three times a day, um, the patients um, will, get, will get better. Um, and so if this is very severe and the patient's incapacitated, um, yeah, there are I think studies of using a phenytoin load, um, gabapentin, but you would try medical therapy first. There are procedures um, where the neurosurgeons go in and actually just put a pledget, I think, like a little piece of you know cotton, sterile cotton between the vessel and the nerve to just separate them. Um, I actually got to see one of these when I was, uh, was I in high school or call? I think I was in high school. I did some summer program in, in Pittsburgh and Peter Janetta, who was the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania and pioneered, I think he may have invented this procedure, um, was operating and they let the students go through to stand and watch through the window. And I thought it would be so exciting, but it's the world's smallest incision and I couldn't really um, see anything. And it was on some screen and all I could just see was, you know, um, tissue and I had no idea what they were doing. But I remember seeing them slide this little cotton or whatever thing is between the nerve and the um, blood vessel. But 
it's um, it's a big <laughs> surgery and a dangerous place and it um, doesn't always work. So we try medical therapy and if it was refractory, that um, surgery can be considered. Um, there's, uh, I think, evidence for radiation to the Gasserian ganglion, just basically um, irradiating the trigeminal ganglion to sort of um, get rid of it with the um, side effect of facial numbness being preferable to the um, excruciating pain. But I think a first pass would be to start this patient on carbamazepine um, and labs we would follow with carbamazepine. Do either of you know Leah or Jasmine for potential toxicities of this anti-epileptic medicine? Oh, uh, yeah, I will ask for a complete blood count, liver function, and serum sodium uh, after starting carbamazepine. Good for you. Yeah, so most anti-epileptics, we would follow liver function tests and, um, and uh, CBC for the rare um, liver and, um, and bone marrow toxicities. But yes, carbamazepine is one where you want to follow sodium as well as these patients can develop. Uh, hyponatremia, which in our patients with epilepsy is actually a risk for having a seizure. So um, that's something to have a baseline value of and follow. Um, and so um, what did you decide to do here, Gabby, and how did it um, work? And just as a other question, as we start wrapping up, unless you have a few twists and turns left for us, um, Leah mentioned earlier, why does this 30-year-old have hypertension and B12 deficiency, I can't think of any obvious relationship between either of those and trigeminal um, pathology, but um, curious how, how that may or may not relate. Yeah, uh, good thought. I actually don't know why she had, I uh, don't have access to these records, um, but uh, after the brain MRI showed that uh, she was started on carbamazepine, and then she didn't uh, improve with carbamazepine. Then we started her on gabapentin and lamotrigine um, with mild control of the pain. And because of that, she was submitted to neurosurgery. But then uh, in, during the surgery, she was found to have an, an arterial venous malformation, which was not seen on the MRI. So they saw she had an anti anterior inferior cerebellar artery connected with the petrosal vein, which was, uh, and then she was submitted to treatment for, for this arterial venous malformation. And after that, uh, the, the trigeminal neuralgia pains, uh, got better. Whoa, that is a surprise. <laughs> so the vascular loop, quote unquote, was actually an AV malformation or there was a, yeah, wow. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, idiopathic, not so idiopathic. And maybe a clue here was just the severity and non-responsiveness to, um, to carbamazepine and, and other escalations in treatment. I'm trying to find this article on trigeminal neuropathies from um, Continuum and not finding it, but I will keep looking and um, we can send it around. Great, so um, trigeminal neuralgia. So thinking fast, won the day here. We heard facial pain neurology morning report and went right there, but we did some good thinking slow exercises just to make sure. And this is really a clinical diagnosis. And I think the main, um, teaching points from my perspective, then we'll hear Sammy's and Gabby's are, if you see this in a young person to think about MS and not because you're demyelinating the nerve, but you're demyelinating the brainstem. And if you see actual sensory objective sensory abnormalities on exam with this semiology to really look hard for a structural um, lesion. This is a case that sort of broke that rule, right? Because there was a structural um, lesion, but it was a structural lesion acting in the same way as a vascular um, loop, so may have thrown us for a loop, no pun um, intended. So um, fantastic discussion, Leah and Jasmine coming to the diagnosis from two words and then reinforcing it um, from the history and also noting some features that, you know, were a little bit hard to integrate the hypertension, uh, B12 deficiency, et cetera, um, which not only had nothing to do with trigeminal neuralgia, but probably nothing to do with um, AVMs either. So, um, Sammy, do you want to give us some teaching points? Then hopefully we'll have time for some of Gabby's um, teaching points related to this classic case with a very non-classic uh, cause. And I'll keep 
looking for this article in the meantime to make sure my trigeminal neuropathy neuralgia um, classification is up to date. Yeah, thank you so much for this great discussion, um, Leah and um, yes, yeah, Jasmine and Gabby, thank you for always having a case in store and this was really amazing. I learned a lot. So pain and type one thinking made us think about trigeminal neuralgia, which most commonly involves the second and third branch of the trigeminal nerve and presents with neuropathic stabbing pain and can also have reflective spasms of facial muscles, which Aaron also mentioned, which is called tic douloureux. I'm not that good in French. <laughs> It can be triggered by speaking, chewing, but also by touch, and it's extremely disabling. It lasts for seconds and can occur up to 100 times a day. And the diagnosis is typically made by history. The corneal reflex is usually normal, but if V1 is affected, it can also be abnormal. Um, you always have to exclude a local process with an MRI, and we learned that it's associated with MS. Then we had the type one, two thinking, the more slow, the slower thinking. Um, is this maybe caused by nerve impingement, by a mass or a vascular lesion? Is there reactivation of a herpes virus, for example, VCV, HSV? Are there any dental pathologies or osteomyelitis, et cetera? Um, then we talked a lot about the cranial nerve five, which is responsible for sensory innovation of the face, cornea, and the tongue, and for the motoric innovation of the masseter muscles. Um, whenever we see a young patient with tri trigeminal neuralgia, we should always think about MS. And we learned, <laughs> we know that it's a central demyelinating disease, but as we learned today, it can also affect the trigeminal nerve because a plaque can build up at the entrance of the cranial, cranial nerve 5 in the pons. And idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia usually occurs in older patients, usually older than 50 years. We also thought about the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, for example, sang, tsuna, paroxysmal hemicrania, hemicrania continua, and cluster headaches that typically present with local facial pain and autonomic symptoms, for example, nasal congestion, eye redness, and tearing, sweating, meiosis, and have various durations. Um, then we also learned the interesting fact that trigeminal neuralgia can also have autonomic symptoms. I didn't know that. Um, if the ophthalmic nerve is affected. And the treatment for trigeminal neuralgia is usually carbamazepine. You have to be careful and monitor liver enzymes carefully, CBC, because it can cause um, leukopenia, but also sodium. And carbamazepine is also a common cause of drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. So check for the eosinophilia if there is any. And if it is refractory, um, Usually microvascular decompression is chosen as a definitive treatment and NSAIDs have no effect. So thank you all so much. Excellent. Um, Gabby, I'm sure you have some teaching points also. Just quickly, I found this article I was looking for and the terminology is if it's caused by the vascular loop, it's classical trigeminal neuralgia. And if it's caused by something else, it's secondary um, trigeminal neuralgia. So I threw that um, direct quotation from continuum in there. If you have access to this, if you're a member of the AAN, I think student membership is probably free. Um, or if your school subscribes to this, it's from the 2021 headache issue. And there's um, a nice cranial neuralgias article with a big um, trigeminal neuralgia section. Um, and talks about these different terms, secondary versus idiopathic versus classical. There's also now classical with concomitant continuous pain. As I mentioned that not all of these fit the classic picture of paroxysmal pain. So as we often talk about here, right, there's medicine 101, the version you learn sort of first pass and study for tests. And then there's real world where everything's a little bit messier, right? Um, great, Gabby, um, what teaching points did you have on this case? And um, yeah, I think uh, for me, this case was very interesting because as you, you all said, from two words, we can diagnose the, per the patient, but uh, real life is a little bit different from the book. So uh, I think uh, for me, it's always important to think about uh, the duration of the pain and 
it's not so easy to get the duration uh, like between one second to five seconds to 100 seconds. So it, it's something that you really have to push for, for the patient to answer because when they are in pain, they do not put a time on it. So it's hard to find. Uh, but I think for me, it was interesting to notice that she had autonomic symptoms and I realized that it was because uh, it not it was not common in her case, but it could be common in V1 trigeminal uh, neuralgia. And I also keep thinking that the brain MRI didn't show the arterial venous malformation. And I always remember that the brain stem is like so tiny and we have to do so many different approaches with the MRI to find what is going on there. But I also kept thinking that we had to treat her for a while and to see if she uh, was getting better and she wasn't. So I don't know if this time was necessary to make the, the, the arterial venous malformation uh, grow a little bit. And if we did a second MRI, it would show there. Uh, yeah, but I think it was interesting to, to see the discussion today. Uh, and I always learned so much here. Thank you so much. Everyone. And we, we want to see another case from... Uh, other parts of the world, not only from Brazil. <laughs> Present a case to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please do bring um, cases, although we always love Gabby's cases. And you might have mentioned this, Gabby, but I was maybe still so surprised to hear the final diagnosis that I didn't register it. Did the patient get better after the ABM surgery? Yeah, yeah. She got better and she was not using any medication after that. Wow. The pain went wow. away completely. Another case, I feel like you can write up pretty much every case um, you send us because this is a very uncommon, to my knowledge, um, cause of this um, syndrome. It has a lot of interesting teaching points as we as we discussed. Well, wonderful. Thank you for bringing a case, um, Gabby. It would always be great to have others um, bring uh, cases as well. And thank you, Jasmine and Leah, for your first time participation. You did a brilliant um, job. And thanks to um, uh, Sammy and I think... Shema as well, but I'm not sure um, writing on the whiteboard. Um, no, okay, just Sammy. Okay, great. Well, thanks, um, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, and we'll see you soon.